And now back to our favorite hobby here on the internet, yelling at retards. The operator of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant has sent a robot inside one of the damaged reactors. The inspection was aimed at pinpointing areas where water is leaking. The utility needs to repair the leaks before it can remove fuel rods and decommission the plant. Tokyo Electric Power Company plans to fill the containment vessels of the reactors with water before retrieving the melted fuel rods. But highly radioactive wastewater continues to leak out of the containment vessels of the number one to number three reactors. So TEPCO first has to repair the damage to the containment vessels and suppression chambers underneath. TEPCO on Wednesday sent a robot with five cameras and a dosimeter into a scaffold around the number two reactor's suppression chamber. Workers maneuvered the robot to check about 90% of the upper part of the 125-meter donut-shaped chamber, but they found no serious damage or deformation. The utility says there were no leaks or water leaks or traces in manholes on the chamber where leakage had been suspected. But TEPCO has not been able to confirm the conditions of pipes connecting the suppression pool and the containment vessel, where the company also suspects water is leaking. Come on to the coast. We'll get together. Have a few laughs. The Tokyo Metropolitan Government is warning that 9,700 people could die if a major earthquake were to hit directly under the capital city. The death toll would be 50% more than earlier estimates. The government's first estimate in six years is based on a worst-case scenario of a magnitude 7.3 quake occurring in the northern part of Tokyo Bay. They also say the quake could be closer to the surface than previously assumed. It says about one-third of Tokyo's 23 wards could experience tremors up to an intensity of 7, which is the maximum on the Japanese scale. It also predicts 70% of the area could experience tremors of 6+. plus. The government's estimate says such a quake could collapse or heavily damage nearly 400,000 buildings. It adds that if the quake hits at around 6 p.m. on a windy winter day, fires could destroy about 200,000 buildings. I can't imagine what might happen. When I think of last year's disaster in Tohoku, we could be next. So we have to prepare properly. Millions of people would be stranded in such a disaster. Collapsed buildings and fires would keep nearly 5.2 million people from being able to return home. Of these, 1.6 million would have to seek shelter outdoors. The government also estimated tsunami damage to Tokyo resulting from a magnitude 8 quake occurring at an underwater trough south of Tokyo. It says a tsunami up to 2.6 meters high could surge into Tokyo Bay but will be blocked by seawalls and floodgates. But the government says if all the floodgates were damaged by the quake and could not be shut, 16 wards would be partially flooded up to about one meter. That would destroy or heavily damage up to 2,500 buildings. This documentary shows what life has been like for people in Fukushima ever since the nuclear emergency. The film Ordinary Life is the work of a cameraman from Sapporo in northern Japan. NHK World's Toru Shimokoshi has more. About 400 people turned out for the premiere in late March. I'm afraid that people will discriminate against me because I lived in Fukushima. I'm also worried that I'll have to live differently than other people. Cameraman Taizo Yoshida interviewed 50 people for his 80 minutes documentary. They describe how they cope with radiation. We might be able to return home in 10 years. We won't be alive then. We'll be dead in a few years. Yoshida arrived in Fukushima a month after the disaster. While working as a volunteer, he shot the film. 
放射能から。People in Fukushima have to go about their daily routine while protecting themselves from radiation. That is their ordinary life now. I think it's hard to put all these feelings into words, but if you approach them sincerely, they'll give you good answers. The invisible threat of radiation has affected the people's lives. This woman is measuring radiation levels outside her home. Yoshida found mothers who are trying to protect their children. The most shocking thing of all was something my young son asked. Mom, how long will we live? He's just a child, much too young to worry about things like that. Mirei Suzuki is one of the mothers who appears in the film. Her son, a college student, lives outside Fukushima. Even though there's less than a 1% chance, radiation could still affect my son. So I keep saying to him, for your mother's sake, don't come back to Fukushima. The last time I saw him was New Year's Day, 2011. Suzuki attended the premiere. Speaking as a mother, she asked the audience to stay interested in the people affected by the nuclear incident. We adults have to think about the future of the generations that follow us. It's our responsibility. I hope that people will continue to hold on to their memories of the ordeal in Fukushima. People who live far from Fukushima don't understand what it's like to deal with radiation every day. Eventually, they will spend less and less time thinking about it. Through this film, you can listen to the residents and think about them. Yoshida is preparing the English translation of this movie. He's hoping to screen the film in Canada and the U.S. this summer. And he'll keep filming in Fukushima in preparation for a sequel. Municipal leaders in Japan's northeast are making the best of a bad situation. Last year's tsunami devastated coastal towns and cities. Evidence of the destruction still remains. So locals are offering visitors disaster area tours. We're taking your one for this week's Road Ahead. Here's NHK World's Yukari Kondo. <laughs> Junko Sasaki from Miyako City leads a tour. The city's tourism office hired her in February as a disaster area guide. The tsunami carried out some of her family members. It also left her jobless. Sasaki found, looking back on the ordeal, how to bear. Then, a friend in Tokyo asked her if things up north were back to normal. She said she hadn't heard much news about the area. That was what made Sasaki apply for the guide position. I was worried that everyone just assumed things were back to normal here. Things are slowly getting better, but we are nowhere close to being back on our feet. In Miyako City, the tsunami swept over one of Japan's largest sea walls. It killed more than 420 people. And the extent of damage was beyond imagination. Before leading her first tour, Sasaki did some research. She knew that many visitors intend to learn about disaster prevention through the experiences of people who went through the calamity. On this day, she visits a local fishing business to see how well the industry is recovering. We are still working on it. By the beginning of June, we should be able to store the kelp in our facilities. 
At first, Sasaki thought giving tours of the Devi City area would be too much for her. But now, as she sees the area rebuilding little by little, she's keen to get the message out to others. I want to know how everyone in the area actually felt. Frustration, sadness, regret, all of it. And I want to be the one to convey these people's feelings to our visitors as much as possible. Finally, Sasaki's first day as a disaster area guide. She works with a group of about 40 people from Tokyo. You can see that the trees on that mountain are black. They were burned by the fires. They built a processing plant there, and the seaweed cultivation is doing very well. We are very relieved, and our optimism is gradually returning. Thank you all for coming. Listening to the stories of what happened at each spot weighed heavily on me. But it was worthwhile. We were hesitant about coming here, but it has been really wonderful. I have seen, heard and felt much. I want to tell others who plan to come here about my experience. I was thrilled by how everyone listened to me so intently. I hope I succeeded in conveying my feelings to them. <laughs> by guiding visitors through the devastated areas, Sasaki and others benefit many people. The visitors get a better idea of how to prevent disasters. The locals make sure that memories of their old dear are not soon forgotten. Yukari Kondo, NHK World, Miyako.